Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, Psalm 37, verse 24. We invite you to get your Bible and join us today. And the Psalm uh, 37, an acrostic psalm, uh, in the Hebrew text, the, every line is represented, or the, the sets of lines are represented by a Hebrew letter. And all of the Hebrew letters are uh, associated with four lines called a quatrain uh, in the Hebrew. And there are three, though, that only have three lines. They're called a triplet, if you will. And they're verses 7, 20, and 34. And this draws special attention uh, to these three particular verses, which just happen to correspond with the, the letters, the numbers assigned by man. The, the chapter numbers and verse numbers are not part of God's Word, and they are all added by man. And, but it, it draws special attention to these three verses, and it's kind of like God uh, giving us a little nugget of truth if you're willing to pay attention and study His Word. But uh, the thought in Psalm 37 is if you think that the righteous uh, get ahead, if you think that crime pays and they always have the nicest cars, the criminals and cheats, if you will, those who have ill-gotten gains, uh, well, they, they, they have a special end coming for them and we're going to learn what that is in our lecture today. So if you think the wicked always get ahead, stay tuned. They don't. Our Father is the judge and He is a righteous judge. We learned in our, the, toward the end of our last lecture in verse 21 that the, the wicked borroweth and payeth uh, not again. And, and it goes on to talk about the wicked and the fact that they're uh, cursed and shall be cut off. And then we took up the righteous, and God said in verse uh, 23 through His servant David, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord or established by the Lord. In other words, if you do things God's way, He'll even guide your steps. So the likelihood that you're going to get off course and go the wrong way is less when God is guiding your steps. And if you're a righteous person, and I'm not talking about a holier than thou, uh, a hypocrite, if you will. Uh, I'm talking about those who try and do things God's way. None of us are perfect. We all fall short. I don't want anybody getting off on a guilt trip and, and thinking that they're going to end up in the lake of fire when they believe and have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. You're not going into the lake of fire. You have grace and, and forgiveness, so uh, just repent for your sins often. So with that introduction, let's uh, pick it up. We're going to be talking about the righteous man again in verse 24. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day, Psalm 37, verse 24, and it reads, And he, and I should say, though he fall, speaking of a righteous man, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. When I read this verse, I couldn't help but think about uh, a first-time parent and when they have a, a one- to two-year-old. And the one- to two-year-old is learning to walk. And it's kind of a difficult thing, you know, to, to pick up. But the parent follows along so closely and, and watches intently. They want to let the infant have their independence and go, but they also want to be there to, to stick out that hand to, 
to uphold the infant to keep him from going all the way down if he starts to stumble. That's why they call them toddlers, you know, because they, they teetle and they toddle and sometimes they fall down. Uh, but that parent is there and the Lord is exactly the same way. If you are righteous, if you're trying the best you can to do things His way. And you know, we all have trouble in our lives, but when we start to fall, if you're righteous, God is there to stick out that hand and keep you from going all the way down. And, and you know, even if you, you do go all the way down, don't ever forget that we live with grace. The Christ paid the, the, the price on the cross so that all we have to do is repent and ask for forgiveness and get back up and do things God's way and, and do them right. Verse 25. I have been young and now am old. This is a, a Hebraism, a figure of speech that, that simply means my whole life. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And now that I'm old, I, I look back and I can't think of one time that, that a righteous man was forsaken. Because if you try and do things God's way, He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1, 2, and 3 will, will document that. And why would the, the righteous man's children uh, never be seen begging bread? Because the house has been blessed. When the leader of the house is cursed, the house is going to pay for it, his, his family. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying children suffer for the sins of their parents as far as a punishment from God. But if the parents are not doing things God's way, the house is not going to be blessed. And it's kind of a, a reciprocal effect on the, the children. But on the other hand, if a man is righteous and does the best he can to do things God's way, the house is going to be blessed. They're never going to go hungry. In fact, he has enough that he can afford to be charitable where the wicked are always have to borrow because they never have quite enough to go around or they've uh, got to put holes in their buckets. That's on a, a physical level that the, the house or the children will never beg bread, but you, we can take that to a spiritual level as well. Who is the bread of life? That's Jesus Christ, of course. And, and in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, we learn that the famine for the end time is not for uh, bread, it's for hearing the word of God. And, and a righteous man uh, always makes sure that his house is blessed both with physical bread to eat and spiritual bread in that he teaches his children the right way and how to obtain salvation through the bread of life. Uh, his, his house never sees famine, whether that is physical or spiritual. Verse 26, He, still speaking of the righteous, is ever merciful. I mean, this merciful means that he is kind to those who are less fortunate than himself, and lendeth and his seed is blessed. Uh, that's a promise from God. So contrary, we have a contrast there that the wicked uh, in, in verse 21 always have to borrow, but those who are blessed, the righteous, have enough to take care of their own and even to lend to others who are less fortunate. And, and you know, everyone falls on hard times occasionally and needs a helping hand. And, and that's a good thing, to be compassionate and to help your brothers and sisters. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we should uh, strictly take someone on to raise forever. As I said, we all fall on hard times now and then. But to continually expect uh, a church or a government or whatever to take care of your every need is unrealistic. If everyone did that, the government would be broke. If everyone did that, we would be living as a socialist nation instead of the United States of America. Enough on that. Let's go with uh, verse 27. Depart from evil and do good 
and dwell forever. Mark that verse down. That's pretty simple, isn't it? A, B, C. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forever. That's the ABCs of eternal life right there. Or you can, you know, the choice is yours. If you wish to stay in evil, in, in wickedness, the ways of the world, stay there. God's not going to drag you out of that and, and make you sit down and repent. Uh, he has a place that you're going to, as we're going to learn here in a few verses, uh, but he's not certainly not going to make you uh, come and repent and make you do good. If you want to choose to do evil, do evil, but you can forget the last part of that, uh, dwelling forevermore. 28, for the Lord loveth judgment. He loves justice. He loves people who are just and do things right and forsaketh not his saints. These are his set-aside ones, his elect, if you will. He knows you, and he loves you very much, and he will not forsake you. They are preserved forever. Do you want to be preserved by your heavenly Father, or do you want to end up in the lake of fire? But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Now let's spend some time with that. I couldn't help but think about uh, Matthew chapter 13, where we have the uh, parable of the tares. And after Jesus expressed the parable, his disciples came to him and said, we don't understand that. Could you explain it? And as Jesus was explaining the parable, my point is that part of it wasn't a parable. He was explaining the parable. He explained that there is good seed that was planted by the Son of Man. That's Christ in the flesh. But then there were the wicked, the seed that were sown by the devil. Check it out, Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. And the devil came and sowed them in among God's children, his seed. We're talking about the Kenites, if you're not aware of it, what his seed is through uh, the serpent in the Garden of Eden when Cain was born. The descendants of Cain are Kenites and the one who sowed them was the devil. And they said, well, should we go and, and tear the tares out of the wheat? And Jesus said, no, leave them alone. The angels will gather them and they will be burned. When are they gonna be burned? They're gonna be burned when they go into the lake of fire. Simple as that. And you know, just as the, and the reason Jesus said that was because the tares look just like the wheat. And if you go tearing, what you think is tares out of the wheat field, you're going to end up tearing some of God's children right along with them. So better to let the angels. And just as some of the tares look like uh, wheat, some of the Kenites look just like Judah. And that's the reason Jesus talked to the church of Philadelphia in Smyrna. And he said, you know who those are who claim to be of Judah, our brother Judah, the tribe of Israel of Judah, but you know, are liars, in other words, and, and they're not. They're of the synagogue of Satan. Uh, that's a very important parable for you to understand, that parable of the tares. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Again, we see this same pattern. Wicked, destroyed, righteous, blessed. You have an inheritance forever, and uh, I hope you don't miss that. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be a short trip uh, for the wicked. 30. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment, or he speaks of justice, in other words, that which is right. And, and the righteous speak wisdom uh, because they're familiar with God's Word, and as it's written in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, that the beginning of knowledge is to fear, actually should have been translated to revere the Lord, but fools despise instruction. Uh, why do the righteous speak wisdom? Verse 31, the law of his God, the righteous, is in his heart, it's in his mind. None of his steps shall slide. When you know 
God's law and the, the uh, punishment, uh, the consequences of breaking uh, God's law, you stick on a, a path of righteousness. You don't want to mess up. And again, we all do mess up, but then repent and ask for forgiveness. I like this, his steps shall, none of his steps shall slide. And you know, if you're about to slide or if you're about to slip, you're not on stable ground. You're, you're probably on some type of wet, muddy surface. And I submit to you that if you will establish yourself on the rock, and I'm speaking spiritually, of course, the rock, Jesus Christ, you'll never slip or slide. You're standing on solid ground, not uh, wet or muddy ground. 32. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Uh, back in Psalm 10, we had that the wicked, even the wicked ones, uh, Antichrist himself, Satan himself, lie in wait and want to murder the righteous just the way they are. You know, I think that probably is because uh, Satan wants company in the lake of fire. And when I say murder, I'm speaking spiritually as well because you can murder someone in the flesh, but you haven't destroyed their soul. Uh, they're with the Father and they're gonna be waiting there for you on when you get there, uh, whenever that is. So uh, I don't care if you've been to trial already, your true trial lies ahead of you. But my point on spiritual murder is that Satan is already sentenced to the lake of fire and he wants as much company as he can get to go in there. So if he can slay your spirit, in other words, cause you to be spiritually dead, it makes his day. Verse 33, the Lord will not leave him in his hand. In other words, the Lord will not leave the righteous in the hand of the wicked, nor condemn him when he is judged. And if you try and do things God's way, in fact, if you, especially those who try and teach God's truth, you can expect to be judged by men, but, and they're, gonna, they're going to condemn you. Uh, why? Because you are causing uh, God's children to return to him. Uh, Satan doesn't like that to happen. And when you do, you better expect uh, that he's going to be attacking you. And he's going to be judging you. He's going to be condemning you. But guess what? Uh, Satan condemning you shouldn't affect you at all. You should let that run off of your back like water off of a duck's back because he's not the judge. You see, your heavenly Father is the judge, and if you do things righteously, it doesn't matter whether the wicked condemn you or not. I'll take my judgment from my heavenly Father, Yahweh. Now we come to verse 34, one of the three that I mentioned that have three lines in the Hebrew text as opposed to four, and it does bring about special meaning to this verse, verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. Keep is shamar in the Hebrew. It means to hedge about or, or guard. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. Not maybe, he will. He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Uh, those elect that stand stood with God in the first earth and heaven age you're going to have the privilege of watching the wicked go into the lake of fire. That's what that verse is promising. And some might say, well, I don't think I want to watch that. I do, uh, because I'll tell you what, that's where we want the wicked going. That's the reason that in the eternity, Revelation chapter 21, there are no more tears. God wipes the tears away from his children's face. There's no more sorrow. There's no more sickness. There's no more death. There's no more tears. Why? Because the wicked have been destroyed in the lake of fire. That's a good thing. We don't want them in the eternity. We'd have things like they are now if the wicked went into the eternity. Uh, I'll take the, the righteous over the wicked any day, uh, being my neighbor. Verse 35, 
I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. The great power here, we could uh, present the beast in Revelation 13, the political beast is going to be a great power, one world power. Uh, Antichrist will be in great power with the, when he returns and heals the deadly wound of the one world political system. And he's going to spread himself like a green bay tree or like trying to be a cedar of Lebanon. And if you've studied with the chapel any length of time, you know that he is nothing but a box cedar trying to be a cedar of Lebanon. You know, he would like to set himself up as a great green fir tree, which is symbolic or symbology of our Lord in Hosea chapter 14, verse 8. He's good. He's going to be setting up his throne, and the whole world, as it's written in Revelation 13, is going to be deceived by him and worship him other than those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Verse 36, Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. This is speaking of the great uh, power of verse 35. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. And back in verse 10, we learned that the wicked, uh, I will diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. I'm going to observe or look upon the place where he was, but he's not there anymore. The Antichrist is not there. Where is he going? He's going, uh, well, the Antichrist himself is going into the lake of fire at the beginning of the Lord's day. Satan, he's going into the abyss for the thousand years to be loosed a short period of time, but he won't have that great power supporting him when he's loosed for that short period of time. He passed away, and lo, he was not. He could not be found, just like the grass that we were talking about in our last lecture back in verse 2. When you cut the grass, you can you see it. It's green. It's laying there on the sidewalk in the street. But after it's cut off, just wait a, a half a day, a day at the most, and it turns brown, and, and a little bit of a wind will just blow it away. A car drives by and it's gone, not to be found. Same thing happens with the wicked, up in smoke forever and ever. Mark 37, Mark the perfect man, or the pious man, probably better said, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. And this peace, you could think of it as uh, that he has peace in the eternity. In other words, he has a future. Uh, the, right, the righteous have a future, eternal life. The wicked and the evil go into the lake of fire. They have no future after that, uh, never to be thought of again. Do you want peace and, and in your life? Do you want eternal life? You're learning how in this, this psalm. And the wicked don't get ahead. What about the wicked? Verse 38. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. How many times does the Lord have to give us that phrase in this psalm to make his point, to, to emphasize the fact that the wicked shall be cut off up in smoke? 39. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And yes, we are even talking prophetically about the day of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation of Antichrist. And if you're one of God's elect, I want you to, to mark this verse down. The Lord, He is their strength. This word strength in the Hebrew a different word than what we normally see. It's maoz, and it means a fortified defense. And I don't care how bad things get for the elect during the tribulation of Antichrist. Don't ever forget the Lord is your strength, your fortified defense. 40. 
And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. They put their confidence in him. They, they don't trust in, in chariots or horses or weapons or, or themselves. They trust in the Lord. And uh, that's the category, that's the group you want to be found in. Now, hidden within this acrostic psalm is a special promise from our Heavenly Father. And he is so good to us with the truths that he shares with us. And we learn from this psalm that the wicked do not get ahead. And, and at this point, I want to cover those three special so uh, verses one more time. And I'm just going to read them through without uh, any comment or anything. Verse 7, 20, and 34. And I hope you'll go back over them with me. Verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of whom him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Verse 20. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. Verse 34, to conclude, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee in, to inherit the land. Uh, when the wicked are cut off, they shall see it. The righteous inherit the land, meaning the kingdom of God and eternal life. The wicked are going to be cut off forever up in smoke forever. So any time that you start thinking that crime pays or that it's just, it's just not fair. Uh, there's a guy over here and he cheats everybody that he can and he's got the nicest car on the block, he's got the nicest boat, he's got the nicest house and, and don't take me wrong, there's nothing wrong with having a nice car, a nice boat and a nice house as long as you obtain them uh, through hard work. And, and being righteous, doing things God's way. But if you got those things by cheating other people out of their hard-earned income, uh, those are called ill-gotten gains. That's wicked, that's evil. Uh, they will not get ahead because, uh, as I said in our last lecture, the only ahead they get is they get to advance to the front of the line of those who are going into the lake of fire. So, Psalm 37, what a, what a beautiful psalm that our Father gave us. We come to Psalm 38. We could call this a prayer and praise in view of future blessing in, in light of Psalm 24. And reminding you, Psalm 24 is where we saw uh, in David's time the Ark of the Covenant uh, coming uh, back to Jerusalem and prophetically we saw the Lord returning and ruling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the one we look forward to, Messiah ruling. And we have a little bit of a different uh, uh, superscription or title to this psalm. Let's talk about that a moment. This is a psalm of David uh, to bring to remembrance. Now this bring to remembrance is used uh, normally of the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement under the old, under the law, the, the period of time where man lived under the law, was one day of the year that Israel uh, repented, if you will, or atoned, a better word, of the sins that went unatoned for throughout the year. In other words, they, they had to cleanse the nation of all that sin that was still there. And there were several things that were done. They had uh, two goats, one goat that represented the Lord, uh, one goat that was offered to the Lord. They had another goat that represented uh, Satan himself, Azazel in the Hebrew language. And the people would symbolically lay their hands on the goat uh, that represented Satan, Azazel, and transfer the sins of the people onto the goat and then a, someone would lead the uh, goat representing Satan 
into the wilderness where he would die, symbolic of getting the sin away from the people of Israel. And of course, uh, our way of atoning for sin when uh, now that Messiah came to the earth in the first advent, of course, is under the period of grace. David is at an extremely low point in his life uh, when this is, is written. I think probably it's soon after uh, the infidelities, the adultery uh, that, that he committed with Bathsheba and that which resulted in the murder of her husband Uriah uh, had come to light and his friends and his family knew what he did. And uh, that's with that introduction, let's pick it up. Psalm 38, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. And this prayer is almost symbolic to Psalm 6, uh, verse 1. Uh, the prayer here of David is to, to change the merited or the deserved anger or wrath of God for rescuing love. Verse 2. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and they, thy hand presseth me sore. The arrows here, uh, symbolic of judgment, if you will. And when we think of God's arrows, you can often think of lightning uh, as well. Uh, David, you know, was a sinner, just as we all uh, are sinners. But uh, thank God for, uh, for Jesus Christ opening the way for grace and forgiveness. We, we don't have to let ourselves get to the very low point that we're going to see David at. Uh, we have repentance and we can obtain forgiveness and go on about our lives without carrying around that burden of sin. David is burdened with sin at this point. Verse 3, There is no soundness or, or wholesomeness in my flesh because of thine anger, the Lord's anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. And here he's kind of admitting he knows what the cause of all this is. It's his sin. And in Proverbs, we're, we're promised that if we live righteously, that we, we get a good night's sleep. And David's saying here, I'm not getting any rest because my conscience is simply eating me up. I've got all this sin on me and, and I don't know how to get rid of it, Lord, you know, help me. And that's the, 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 where we're going to pick it up tomorrow in our next lecture is to what will David finally come to his senses and, and straighten up and, and obtain forgiveness, atone for his sins, the means he had to do then. And the question for us to ask ourselves is, when we have that burden of sin loaded on us, will we walk around with it and let ourselves get to the point where we're beating ourselves up? You know, Satan loves, especially when one of God's elect let themselves get down to that point because he jumps on with both feet when that happens. I mean, here you are criticizing yourself and your conscience is eating you up and he'll sit there and just beat you up day in and day out until you finally come to your senses and learn how to deal with it, to obtain forgiveness and to rebuke Satan. I've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world it was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age the creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and our good friends to the north in Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. We do ask that you not ask about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. We choose to teach God's Word in a positive format. Uh, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. If you're studying uh, via the internet or shortwave radio somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number, uh, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in and uh, always a pleasure to hear from you. And we do uh, got a prayer request. We don't need to do it. We can do away with that telephone. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you. You know, He developed a way that you can talk to Him. It's called prayer. And I encourage you to use that line of communication. Uh, unlike your telephone line, which the more you use it, the more it costs you, uh, the more you use the line of communication with your Heavenly Father, probably the less it will cost you on Judgment Day. By that I meant be sure and, and go to Him in prayer, repent of your sins, you can't con God, but repent Him with a true repentant heart. And those sins are gone. They're, they're wiped away. They're not going to be burdening you down. You have a, a clean slate, a fresh start. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask You to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, illnesses, uh, problem marriages, Father. Uh, you know if it's Your will, a special blessing on each of these, Father. We also remember our military troops who are in harm's way around the world. Father, we ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. First up today, we have John in New York, and John asks, I'm interested in some information about the Garden of Eden. It was mentioned that there was another female before Eve. Was her name Lilith? Question. Is it true that she would not submit and was therefore banished from Eden? She was then replaced by Eve. Are my facts accurate? Is there more to the story? Any information on Lilith and Eden would be greatly appreciated. Well, you'll have to go elsewhere for any information on Lilith than Shepherd's Chapel or God's Word for that matter because I don't know where she was mentioned but you can bet it was not in God's Word. Lilith is, is a myth. Uh, it's an attempt, I believe, for scholars or someone, and they're not biblical scholars for sure because she's not in the Bible, but it's an attempt for people to explain how the different races are originated and it's difficult to explain, impossible to explain how a man and a woman of identical race uh, could have children that led to multiple races that we have around the world today. It's biologically impossible. And of course, the thing they're missing is that uh, God's Word is true and the creation of all the races is covered in Genesis 1 and 2. There were different peoples created. All races did not come from Adam and Eve, and Lilith certainly wasn't in the mix at all. Not biblical. Carol in California. My daughter and I are studying Ezekiel chapter 44. Help us understand about seeing our loved ones in heaven. We cannot find what you are talking about. Well, in Ezekiel chapter 44, uh, begin with uh, verse 25, 26, 27, and you'll find there that the Zadok, that's the elect who uh, don't worship the Antichrist, who reign with Christ a thousand years, as it's written in Revelation chapter uh, 20, verse 4, are allowed to leave the millennial temple if one of their immediate family members didn't make it in the first resurrection. In other words, they're spiritually dead is what that means. 
but they're allowed to leave and go to that one in an effort to try and help them. Obviously, you would have to and understand that's in spiritual bodies there. So you would have to recognize them to be able to go to them. That's, that's the point and the logic behind it. And of course, there's a penalty to pay in the fact that they, those that they're going to try and help are dead, spiritually dead. Uh, when they return to the Millennial Temple, they're not allowed to go into the presence of Jesus Christ for seven days uh, because they are unclean, because they've been uh, exposed to the dead, spiritually dead. Jair, I believe this is from Louisiana, I enjoy and have learned so much from your teachings. My husband passed in March, and we're sorry for your loss, and if God comes for us, where can I find it in the Bible that I will see him again? Well, we just covered that, Ezekiel chapter 44, 25, and the following verses. If you are able to go to your immediate family, uh, you obviously would have to recognize them. Teresa in Arkansas, what does it say that a man should not lay with a, where does it say that a man should not lay with another man and a woman should not lay with another woman? Well, it's stated in a figure of speech in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 22, verse 5, where we learn that <clears throat> a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man and vice versa, a man shall not wear that which pertains to a woman. Woman, and that's a figure of speech. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you wear pants or skirt or whatever. It's, it's a figure of speech. And it means that a woman should not take a man's place in sexual intercourse, nor should a man take a woman's place in sexual intercourse. Uh, other scripture that gets even more plain than that figure of speech, uh, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Leviticus chapter 20, uh, verse 13. You want New Testament? It's there. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. And 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. And, you know, God's word is very specific about homosexuality. And I won't apologize uh, that God's Word is very uh, specific about homosexuality. Uh, we don't teach hate here at Shepherd's Chapel toward any group, but we do teach God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we'll let the chips fall where they fall, but we will continue to teach uh, His Word. Jeff in Oregon. Where in the Bible does it say that it is a sin to lust after your own wife? I don't believe you'll find that anywhere in the Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, uh, we learn that it's not all right to lust after any and every woman. In other words, anything that, that has a skirt, I've heard some men say. Uh, that is wrong to, to do that, to have... Uh, feelings toward your wife uh, in that nature. I don't believe you're going to find it in God's Word that that's forbidden. Randy in North Carolina, how will we know? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble finding. Jesus will come out of the sky so we won't follow the Antichrist. Antichrist comes before him. How will we know? And if you're talking about how will we know whether it's Antichrist or Jesus, well, if you understand the Trumps, you understand that the sixth Trump, when Antichrist returns, comes before the seventh Trump, when Jesus returns. A simple rule of thumb to go by is, is that if you're still in the flesh and someone's standing in front of you claiming to be Christ, it's not Christ. Because when Christ returns at the second advent, we step out of these flesh bodies and into spiritual bodies. So if you can pinch yourself and you feel it, you are still in the flesh and Jesus has not returned. Angie in Louisiana, I want to know if there is any way we can know that Jesus was for sure born on September 29th. And shouldn't we be celebrating Christmas on September 29th? Uh, you have brought me so far and so close to our Father. 
I hang on every word spoken on your program every day. God bless you. Well, thank you for that witness, Angie. And God's Word is so powerful uh, when you understand it. And, and we're glad that you are close uh, to your Heavenly Father. You know, I, I would suggest that you order Pastor Arnold Murray's teaching uh, on Christmas is the title of it. Uh, it's a CD 30517. And you'll learn, and he teaches you, shows you how to find it in God's Word. Luke chapter 1, the birth date of Christ is tied to the birth date of John the Baptist. And to determine the birth date of John the Baptist, if you're familiar with the, one of the 24 uh, courses of the priest, the, the course of Abiah, uh, you can determine when John the Baptist was born. If you have that, we know that Jesus was six months younger than John the Baptist. So uh, it, when you understand all that, it becomes very apparent that Jesus was conceived on December 25th and born on September 29th. Now, you're talking about should we celebrate Christmas on September 29th, I would submit to you that the Word became flesh on December 25th. And the Word becoming flesh, I'm talking about Jesus uh, being uh, conceived in Mary's womb, was a reason to celebrate because He was in the flesh at that point. Percy in California, Jacob wrestled with God. God is almighty. How come Jacob won the fight? Because God led him. Uh, simple as that. Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. Uh, the reason that God let him win was because of what he named Jacob after that event happened. What did he say? God said to Jacob, thy name shall be called Jacob no more but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men. And that's what Israel means is he will rule as God. But God let him win that fight, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and to make a point, Irene in Maryland, today in Washington it rained and there was a double rainbow. Is there any significance to that? Well, there's a significance to the rainbow, not necessarily the double rainbow in Genesis uh, chapter 9 verses 13, 14, and 15. God promises there, uh, he, he calls it a covenant. I, I, I make a covenant with earth and man this day, the earth and all who inhabit it, including uh, the animals, that I will never flood the earth as I did in the time of Noah and I put the bow in the sky, he means the rainbow, uh, to uh, uh, seal that covenant or as a sign of that covenant. And of course, the, the, the uh, flood that we need to worry about of, of this generation is not a flood of the earth as in Noah's time. The flood that you need to be aware of and be prepared for, you'll find in Revelation chapter 12, verses 15 and 16, and it's called the flood of Satan's lies. When he returns to earth as Antichrist, he's going to be claiming to be Jesus Christ, and many are going to be deceived by his flood of lies. I hope uh, you aren't. Jeannie in North Carolina, I have been watching your program for six months and I absolutely love it. Thank you. Well, thank you for that witness. I want to know where is a good place to start my studies of the Bible as a beginner. I would appreciate your advice. Okay, good question, Jeannie. And on page three of every newsletter that we send out each month, and if you've requested the free introductory offer, uh, you started receiving the newsletter, which by the way you get for a six month period of time. If we haven't heard from you in that period, we assume that you're no longer interested. And as stewards of the Lord's money, uh, we're not going to waste money sending you future further newsletters if you have no interest whatsoever. So uh, you need to let us hear from you at least every six months. Uh, and it, all it has to be is a postcard saying, I am enjoying the newsletters, please keep them coming. And, and that's all you have to do. But on page three of every newsletter, you'll find a list of suggested 
studies, whether CDs or cassette tapes, your choice, uh, for new students. And that's critical that you have those studies under your belt. And then where you go from there, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Uh, the books listed there, you find Genesis, uh, the first six chapters, and also the book of Revelation. You know, if you don't understand the beginning of God's Word and the end of God's Word, there's no way you're ever going to understand what you find in between the beginning and the end. Uh, the book of Daniel is also a critical study. So, And then there are several single study CDs and tapes uh, that, uh, such as the parable of the fig tree, three world ages, uh, God's elect, and the list is there for you. So uh, good place to start. It's kind of like algebra. You have to have a good foundation laid before you can start building on that. So get a good solid foundation laid by understanding those suggested studies for new students and then go from there. William in North Carolina, Melchizedek, king of Salem, was that Jesus Christ or was that just some other king? It was uh, Jesus Christ, uh, no question about it. In John chapter 8, verses 56, 57, and 58, uh, the Kenites were, were talking to uh, the Lord. And, and he said, you know, uh, and there were others there besides the Kenites as well, but Jesus said to them, you know, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they said, you're not even 50 years old yet. How can you say Abraham rejoice to see your day. And then he concluded in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. And then if you're familiar with Genesis chapter 14, verses 18, 19, and 20, you know that Melchizedek met Abraham in the way and received tithes of him. And that's how Jesus could say in John chapter 8, verses 56 through 58, that your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Uh, looks like B. Meatris, I hope that's right, North Carolina. Why in the first part of the Bible was it okay to have so many wives and be so promiscuous? Okay. I guess that's what you meant. And there's a lot of O's there. It's kind of like here in Arkansas, you know, we're getting close to football season and we have a lot of O's following an S here, but it's not so, it's sui. Anyway, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God said, be fruitful and multiply. That was his instruction to, at the beginning. Why? Because there were very few people on earth and it was a big place, a lot of land. It needed to be inhabited, so God said, uh, be fruitful and multiply. But then, uh, about the time of Moses, he gave the law uh, of, of, of multiple wives or, and were only to have one wife. And Well, actually, it was not that case. I, mean, I got off track there. Uh, David had many wives. Solomon had many wives. But now we live under civil law that says you should only have one wife, and that's the way it should be. And besides that, we got so many people on earth now, uh, some people have a hard time finding any room at all. Fran from Texas. Fran from Texas, please explain the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 1.28. He, I guess referring to God, created male and female and told them to be fruitful and multiply. It's amazing we just had that question. So therefore, that had to mean have intercourse. You got it, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, though. God said uh, to Adam and Eve, of all the trees in the garden, you may freely eat. But, and this was the first commandment of God in his word of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, in the day you eat of it, thou will surely die. And then you go on then in Genesis 3, 5, when Satan tempted Eve and they had intercourse, I understand she wasn't supposed to lie with Satan, but did Eve and Adam not have desire for each other until Satan tempted them? It states that they were both completely innocent. 
Jim from Illinois, I thank God for your ministry. Thank you for that and staff and thanks for remembering the staff. My question is on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. I've heard and read some Bible commentators state that the verse in the quote, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken away of the way, end of quote, means that the ministry of the Holy Spirit exhibited in the church is now hindering the work of the man of sin until the church is taken out of the way, and they would be wrong. Uh, that, that letteth, that verb in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, letteth is a transitive verb. It means simply that you, you transfer this back to the subject of the previous verse. The he who letteth, uh, and if you know who is holding Satan at this time under his thumb, which is Michael the archangel, uh, then you know that, uh, that, that, that it is Michael who will let the Antichrist onto earth. Actually, you're not going to let him on, you're going to boot him on. Angela in Florida, why does God's mercy seat need protection from the likes of Satan? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, Satan was promoted to the cherub that protects the mercy seat. You see, he didn't want to be the protector of the mercy seat. He wanted to be the one sitting on the mercy seat. That's a place reserved for only Jesus Christ. So, yeah, it needs protection at this point in time. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal because uh, you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know what? It makes your Father's Day when He looks down and He sees you studying His Word, trying to uh, glean wisdom from His Word, which is the only true wisdom. It makes His day. Blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness? One thing that's most important, though, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day, every day, and your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble, because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.